So, thank you everybody for being with us. Uh, thanks to the people in Europe that are with us, even if they, are, they wake up not long time ago. Thank you for being with us. So, this is um, a town hall meeting that um, is dedicated to a very specific topic, um, a regional topic, let's say, but that we hope could be a learn, learning experience for other region of the world. As you know, this is dedicated to the uh, European election 2024 that will take place in June next year and to the measures that has been put in place by, Europe, by the European Union and, and other stakeholders in order to uh, secure these uh, elections and make um, a normal process not, uh, um, with not so many interference, but at least where the interference that will happen will be reduced at the minimum in terms of impact on the freedom of the uh, voters in order to express their views and their um, their opinions. Um, to discuss about this uh, complex topic, um, we have many actors that are those working in this com complex machinery to try to uh, ensure the security of the elections. We have um, two representatives of the European Commission, because the European Commission is the main actor that promoted this initiative. Uh, one is with us here in the room in Kyoto, uh, Esteb Sanz, uh, and another one is uh, in Brussels, is Albin Birger, if he's German, or Berger, <laughs> if he's French. We don't know, this is the beauty of Europe. Um, and then we have um, uh, the chair of the task force that the European Union, through EDMO, has put in place to uh, deal with the disinformation issues during the elections. Uh, Giovanni Zagni. Uh, we have uh, Paola Gori in Florence, that um, is the person behind EDMO, that is the European Digital Media Observatory, uh, that uh, is the body in charge from the European Union to put in place this task force. Then we have uh, a representative of ERGA, because, as I said to you, this is a multilateral effort, multi-stakeholder effort, so the regulatory body play a very important role. So we have Stanislav Mateka from Slovakia that is with us, will explain the role of the regulator in that. And of course, uh, last but not least, we have two other important components, the industry represented here by Caroline Greer uh, from TikTok. Welcome, Caroline. Uh, and civil society represented by Eric Lambert uh, in Rome. So, all European panel, uh, but very, uh, very composed, very st multi-stakeholder. Um, I would um, start giving the floor to the initiator of the process, that is the European Commission, because this initiative is not uh, a standalone initiative, but is part of a larger framework uh, that um, has been mentioned, by the way, the other day from Commissioner Europa that was here at the opening, and Esteve was with her. Please, Esteve. Thank you so much, uh, Giacomo, for inviting the European Commission to this, uh, to this event. I will give the floor very quickly to my colleague, Alvin, who is a real expert on, on this information for the Commission. I, I'm the head of Internet Governance um, in, in DigiConnect as well. Um, from the point of view of Internet Governance, of course, the IGF is a, is a critical institution uh, for us of the multi-stakeholder system. And when it comes to this information, which is such a crucial um, uh, development in these in this societies that we live in, what we have seen precisely these days is how good the IGF is a platform to discuss these critical issues. And uh, this testifies of the health of the IGF, uh, how the IGF is really ready to, to discuss all these critical issues in, in ways that are very, uh, are very concrete and very substantial. And you mentioned that our our vice president was indeed here, which also testifies of how important the IGF is for, for the European Commission. And uh, she had the, the chance not only of participating in this uh, high-level panel on this information, but also to exchange with the multi-stakeholder community, with all stakeholders, including, uh, including governments, about this information. And I can tell you that uh, 
there seems to be an agreement that this is a, a very strong concern in every country that we had the exchange, uh, the, the possibility to exchange with. Uh, they, there are similar, similar very, very clear campaigns, there's information campaigns going on that potentially relate to electoral processes. Um, really the IGF, I think, that provided uh, the VP a very good, uh, a very good venue to, to take the polls of this uh, global phenomenon, which is for sure not only European, and that it's really impacting uh, across the globe. Um, I would uh, maybe just remind a bit what uh, one of the things that the VP said during this uh, high-level session um, on, on this information before Alvin comes to uh, more concrete aspects on how the Commission is tackling, is tackling the phenomenon. Um, the VP put a lot of uh, emphasis in, in um, in the definition of this information. So she said very clearly that we, all that we do in policy making process in the EU on this information starts with a, with a definition, which is basically that this information has to be intentional. It's, it's something that happens uh, because some actors engage intentionally in a, a disinformation action or a disinformation campaign. Um, and what she said as well, it's something that has also been part of the overall discussion in this IGF, which is that with uh, generative AI, these intentional elements of this information are basically amplified. Amplified up to a point where producing these information campaigns is increasingly becoming extremely cheap. And with that uh, phenomenon, uh, the alert of policy makers on, on the issue should be uh, just uh, higher as it is in the EU. In the EU, and she was very clear about that, uh, there is of course a human-centric approach to, to technologies and digital policies and this also is involved into this process. Um, on the one hand, she said, we don't give rights to AI. We don't give uh, free speech rights to AI. We don't, re we don't give copyright rights to AI. Um, but at the same time, we do give tools and rights to, to citizens in relation to this phenomenon. And she emphasized how positive it is the European Commission in considering uh, measures, including in the AI Act, of uh, watermarking uh, AI-generated content to basically help the users and the citizens identify when uh, content has been produced uh, by these technologies. So overall, it was a very powerful presence to have here at the VP. Of course, uh, she could only, only engage into general messages about uh, our policy-making process. Uh, I think that my colleague uh, Alvin uh, will, will provide you more concrete uh, aspects of, of the framework in which the Commission is operating these days on, this, on the disinformation landscape. So, Thanks. Albin, you have been put on the spot. We are pending from your you. mouth. Thank I, you very much. I Good can morning. Ask me for the slides. I have here the tool for advancing it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, pleasure to be with you. And thanks, Steph. Thank you, Giacomo, for the introduction and having me. Um, indeed, we could move to the presentation. Uh, I cannot see it right now here, but leave it up to you. Um, as, as you said, Estev, um, the idea is to, to set the scene on how the EU is addressing um, uh, this information. Um, basically, and um, in very broad terms, um, the EU is taking action in three different fields. And then these are essentially uh, reflecting also the, the the institutional architecture of uh, the EU institutions. On the one side, you have the Commission, but also the European External Action Service. Um, three fields, legislation, external actions, and communication. Um, again, in broad terms, and due to the division of tasks um, by policy of the European Commission, each director general DigiConnect, whom I represent today, uh, takes care of a, of, of a different field. Um, when I mention legislation, and I'll come back to that in, in the next slide probably in more details, um, we can ident 
but that that can come in a moment. I'll, I'd like to to just give you an overview of, of the other aspects um, briefly. Um, regulation, legislation, or co-regulation when it comes to the code of practice on disinformation, regulation being the Digital Services Act and the Digital Market Acts, but also um, in broader uh, terms, in when it comes to funding projects, we are also supporting the European Digital Media Observatory, EDMO, and uh, Paula will, will talk about that in, in a moment, I suppose. Um, when it comes to the EAS, um, well, for many years, the, the EAS has been addressing uh, and tackling foreign information manipulation and interference. So that is basically how um, external actors may affect the, the discourse or the public uh, uh, opinion in the EU. Um, a number of tools are set up, um, putting uh, in touch either the European institution and its member states, but also um, wider stakeholders at international level to ensure or seek for a more systematic information exchange uh, with those stakeholders, be it uh, the G7, be it, the, be it NATO, and, and in other fora. Um, the EAS also has a very operational aspect or division, Stratcom, which then looks into more details into data analysis and, and media monitoring to identify and expose actually uh, cases originating uh, in, in media um, or covert influence operation by uh, external state or non-state actors. Finally, from the Commission side, which is a bit more internally oriented, but uh, worth to mention is obviously also to address uh, or pre-bank um, possible narratives that are um, developing in various policy areas and to put in touch the various responsible um, DGs per policy area, be it climate change, um, migration, um, we seek, or DG, the DG Communication seeks to um, establish uh, communication channels and uh, possibly also uh, pre-bank or debunk narratives developing. Uh, on the next slide, um, I'll get into um, more uh, of the DG Connect part that I mentioned. The Digital Services Shortly, Act, obviously, uh, I, so, this is all fine indeed, thank yes. you. Um, the Digital Services Act, um, adopted and in, and in force um, currently, um, is the new EU regulation um, establishing standard for the accountability of uh, online platforms regarding uh, illegal content, disinformation, and other societal risks. Um, accountability on how they moderate um, content, on advertising, uh, on algorithmic uh, processes, and so, through this, um, very large online platforms and very large online services, um, sorry, <laughs> search engines, um, have to address the risks um, that are related to uh, disinformation. And the Commission is uh, equipped with uh, a wide ranging uh, investigatory and supervisory powers. Um, linked to that, but in a sense, not at all um, a, a regulation as such. Uh, is the code of practice, which is a self-regulatory and voluntary tool that is not totally new. It was established, developed in 2018, um, but revamped, strengthened in 2022. And, and it, it really is the industry um, attempt to establish uh, commitments and measures uh, at granular level um, to address various aspects um, that are pertinent when one uh, aims to address the disinformation phenomenon. Uh, here are mentioned a few areas or chapters of the code. Demonetization, of course, um, the aim would be to cut financial incentives for um, purveyors of disinformation. So signatories in that field would take uh, commitments to avoid, for instance, the placement of advertising um, next to disinformation content on their services or also to avoid disseminating advertising that contains disinformation or links to disinformation uh, sources. Um, fact checking, access to, to data for researcher, these are also important fields. You would add uh, user empowerment through tools uh, and, uh, in, 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 
and initiatives to understand and flag this information for the users to better understand uh, what, what or identify basically um, this information content. Um, one could also mention integrity of services, which is basically uh, what was already mentioned a, a bit earlier by Steph. For instance, um, prevent manipulative behaviors on their services in the forms of deepfake or AI generated uh, content. Um, the core regulatory aspect, if you want, of the code of practice is um, an important innovation and that links to the DSA in the sense that um, for certain um, signatories of the code, the major online platforms, um, the code of practice aims to become a code of conduct under the DSA, basically a possible means for them to demonstrate that they comply with um, their obligation to mitigate risks. Um, and finally, last but not least pillar of our approach is indeed um, the EDMO, the European Digital Media Observatory. Um, through EU financing, um, we support the development of a cross-border multidisciplinary community of independent fact-checkers and uh, uh, academic researchers. Um, this is um, um, comprising, if you want, a central um, uh, system, digital platforms, combined with national or regional hubs covering the EU uh, territory and population. Um, but I think I will, uh, I will leave uh, also uh, Paula to get uh, into that more specifically. Last slide, if you may. Um, getting more into um, EU elections, this is of course uh, an important, um, we have an important calendar ahead in the EU that you already mentioned national elections culminating with European elections uh, in spring. And uh, as part of the code of practice, but more generally as part of the enforcement of the DSA as well, um, we are um, seeking to, uh, well, an important part will be to focus on countering disinformation related risks uh, in, in these periods on elections. Um, when it comes to the code of practice, um, this has prompted the signatories to strengthen the exchanging and, and setting out of all the actions that they are expected to take uh, during elections. So we established a specific working group um, to tie also to what has been said earlier on um, regarding generative AI being a challenge, including in that particular context. There will also be uh, work carried out on, on that in particular with dedicated subgroups. So this basically illustrates a little bit, again, our approach to a multi-stakeholders involvement as everyone has responsibilities and tools and uh, need to take up the fight on, on this information. Um, the same applies if you want with Edmo Task Force on Election, which has been set out um, to carry out a risk assessment ahead of the European election and foster the, the participation at uh, a more expert level on, on those aspects. And being mindful of time, I think I will leave it here, but happy to take any questions during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Albin. Um, now, Stanislav uh, Mateika, uh, that I said before, is the um, regulator, representative of the regulator, and in particular is within ERGA uh, with a specific task that is uh, linked to the uh, election process. So, Stanislav, yes. uh, one question just to um, introduce you. Uh, the question mm -hmm. is, my colleagues from other regions of the world here, when they hear about this initiative, they say, but this will mean to create a minister of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say no, because we have on board other stakeholders and we, mm -hmm. we have the regulators, the independent regulators that are mm -hmm. the arbiters of this process. So if you can explain better what is the, your role, because this is mm -hmm. a, a key question for the other region of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giacomo. And uh, thank you, Alban, also for setting the scene here so that I don't have to go uh, into details that you already described. First of all, I should say that ERGA stands for the European Regulators Group for Audiovisual Media Services, which is an expert body, uh, European body, that focuses on effective uh, implementation. Specifically, we were uh, the body was created to enforce and implement in the most effective way 
the audiovisual media services director. So this is our core mission of the whole group. And the members of this group are uh, charged uh, to enforce both the European and their own national legislation when it feels uh, when it comes to media regulation. For uh, several decades, audiovisual media regulators have been focusing on broadcasting, which basically everybody means television and radio. But for the last uh, decade, and, and part, sort of a decade, we also entered the field of digital media. Uh, and uh, the media regulators uh, covers rules for advertising in general and advertising, political advertising in particular, is something very important uh, on the agenda of the media regulators in Europe. And building on this, we have started to look at election integrity protection uh, and we put it high up on our agenda as well. And we have focused on this issue ever since the first code of practice was um, that came to existence, as Alban mentioned in 2018. And ERGA has been tasked uh, by the European Commission at the time to monitor the initial code of practice and publish several reports. And we focused a lot on political advertising because there's a lot of interest and a lot of expertise on, behalf, on the side of the regulators. So those of you interested in the role of regulators and the assessment of the regulators of the initial code of practice, you can go ahead on the ERGA website and read all the, all the findings that uh, we have come together to. Uh, now, since, uh, as Alba mentioned, the code has been revamped in 2020, ERGA has taken a very active role in both, you know, providing expertise to the Commission in negotiations of the code of practice and coming together with the industry and other uh, stakeholders, fact checkers and researchers with a newly created task force under the code of practice and disinformation. And I, I feel that this is a very important step in actually making the multi-stakeholder approach to this uh, reality. So we are sitting around the table as regulators together with EDMO, with the European Commission, with the industry, and with the fact checkers and researchers. And so you can see in this multi-stakeholder approach that there's a lot of independent bodies, independent from the governments, from the industry, like regulators, researchers, and fact checkers that have a say in how the code of practice, first of all, should look like in the first instance, and then how it should be understood, interpreted, and kind of implemented, not necessarily enforced, because it's, it's self-regulation, as, as Alba mentioned. Um, so our approach to protection of integrity of elections, our, as ERGA, is, and this is uh, my in interpretation of the code of practice, is through transparency. So uh, code of practice introduces transparency, um, obliga obligation, sorry, obligation, basically, commitment, at least, to publish transparency reports on, their on the measures taken by the platforms uh, to protect elections or to fight misinformation and disinformation in general. Uh, one more area that we focus on a lot I hope you can hear me. My video just froze. Um, uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. The, uh, you are frozen, you. but we can hear you. I'm not sure why. Let me just check. But I wanted to say, of, uh, uh, I wanted to talk a bit uh, also about the upcoming regulation on, on uh, targeting of political advertising. That um, this is upcoming. This is not yet enforced. Is it still in the legislative process? Um, but Erga is taking an active role in providing the expertise there as well. And so the, when it comes to the measures that as ERGA we would uh, propose when it comes to you know, protection against misinformation and specifically in the context of elections, uh, we very much focus and appreciate the focus on transparency and the, this new regulation together with the code of practice focuses on this aspect very much. Uh, for example, the regulation introduces obligations to publish transparency notices next to political advertising so that users and citizens in the EU can be informed that the advertising they're seeing on online services is actually the political advertising. Uh, other other area or measure measure that we focus on is monitoring the effective enforcement of the platform's own policies on something that is called in certain areas TTPs, which is tactics and tech, um, techniques uh, and um, uh, yeah. No, so uh, manipulative behavior, coordinated inauthentic behavior or contents, uh, all of these areas are very well covered by most of the very large online platforms actually now in their terms of service. 
and our role within this whole context is to oversee and monitor how effective they are in enforcement of their own policies. Then what we're uh, proposing as a measure to protect elections against misinformation and manipulation is we want to see functioning reporting mechanisms for regulators and researchers or anybody actually, citizens, to report or flag to the platforms that there is a uh, misinformation happening at the moment and we want you to look at it and enforce your policies in place. This is relevant very much for the regulators. Another, maybe it's a bit technical, but still very important issue is, of course, effective repositories of political advertising to be um, scrutinized then by the regulators and independent researchers as well. And one very key area, and I think um, Paula will, will probably also touch upon this, is access to data. And uh, this also has a link to DSA, the Digital Services Act. The, the um, access to data is crucial for the for public scrutiny through independent research. And I think this is this is key for us as regulators as well to have the input from the research community to inform enforcement of the regulatory framework that we have in place. Uh, I would stop here and apologize for no camera. Apparently, I can't connect the camera back. Sorry for that. Thank you, Stanislav. So, uh, you deny to be the Minister of Truth in this case. Uh, and uh, very if much. He, if he's not you, then probably will be Paola that has to play this role. That is now our next speaker. Can you hear me well? Yes, and we can see your, your slides. Super, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, spoiler, I'm not the Minister of Truth. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll tell you why. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Paula. I'm the Secretary General of EDMO, which was mentioned already by my um, uh, colleagues in, in this in this panel. So, the European Digital Media Observatory. Uh, why do we need uh, this observatory? Uh, there is agreement, uh, and it was also mentioned previously, that when it's about this information, it's about a multi-stakeholder and disciplinary approach. It's, there is no one solution, single solution. There are many different approaches and solutions that together actually uh, build, a, if you want, a macro solution. And uh, let me just mention uh, um, some, some key words that show how it is important to have this approach. Uh, some of these uh, uh, concepts were already mentioned uh, by uh, the other colleagues. Think of human rights, research, AI, uh, fact-checking, um, content moderation, media literacy. Um, but I'm adding here or the other, also other stuff, for example, uh, the role that is played by emotions in, uh, in sharing this information or um, the impact that actually visuals have uh, uh, compared to text and the fact that of course we have to uh, analyze the data um, lots of I mean these are just a few keywords to show you how many expertises we need because we, when I go back for example to emotions I mean I have a legal background I don't cannot give you uh, uh, evidence of the role played by emotions but neuroscientists can do and uh, the fact-checking organizations and later on you will uh, talk to um, Giovanni uh, they don't work uh, in a silos, they work with other uh, experts and what they do actually, what they produce is very important for, for, our, for citizens, it's important for uh, research and so on. So as you see, it's, it's many different fields and many different experts and many different expertises. So um, th that's basically behind, the, behind EDMO. So the idea uh, is that we have a platform, which is EDMO, which is uh, funded by the European Commission, as it was previously said, that is acting completely independently. And the platform gathers the stakeholders and the expertises uh, that I was uh, mentioning previously. And uh, when possible, actually provides also evidence and tools. So basically think of a big platform, a big boat where all the experts come together and where uh, uh, tools are offered to those experts to work in, in the best way. Um, these are uh, the partners of, of EDMO. So we are a, a, a consortium of, uh, of different organizations. Um, and um, our main activity basically focuses on fact checking, on uh, academic research, and on media literacy. Um, how do we do that? Uh, we uh, uh, basically have co uh, secure collaborative platforms for this community. So this is a secure online place where they can gather, where they can share best practices, where they can work together. We do uh, work on maps and repositories, for example, 
scientific articles or we map the media literacy initiatives in the EU member states so that basically the experts can have comparable data, for example, or can access evidence that is of their interest. Uh, we are working, and I get back to that, on a framework to access the data of the online platforms for research purposes. We have training a training program that actually our uh, trainings are all online and for free uh, on specific topic on disinformation. We carry out policy analysis, we have a specific task force uh, and so on. Uh, let me now focus on the main activities. Um, for fact checking um, here, it's just a couple of examples, but let me say that we have a network of fact checkers that apply to join the network and respect a given number of criteria that we identify and this fact check is this network is really uh, something very precious because um I mean, probably it looks like something very, very obvious, but when you have a network, you can really, really uh, advance to the second, uh, if you want, a level in the sense that, let me just mention, for example, when it was, it is actually still about the war in Ukraine, uh, the moment uh, the, 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 the war started, the um, the fact checkers were united in sharing information, in sharing um, this information that they were detecting in their countries and they were informing the other uh, fact checkers uh, in the other countries. That helped us a lot. I have to say here, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from Pagella Politica are doing a, an incredible work in coordinating, so in gathering uh, the, the, the disinformation narratives that are uh, um, detected in the member states and in sharing it also with others. And considering that we know that actually uh, fact checking is most effective when it is uh, done in the first 24 hours the fact that you can count on a colleague in another member state saying you know what here in my country today we discovered i mean we realized that there is this this information narrative be prepared it may arrive in your country as well you you can understand actually how important such a network is uh, here you see actually our database where we have re that is regularly updated with um, uh, this information which is debunked by the uh, fact checkers in our network and out of the work that they are doing we also publish monthly briefs in which we uh, basically uh, recap the main disinformation narratives that were uh, um, uh, detected in a given uh, month in, in the EU. Uh, on media literacy, um, as you, for those who are familiar media, with media literacy, this is a very large uh, field because it involves many different actors, it has different target audiences and so on. So here what we are trying to do is try to put some, if you want, some order, uh, precisely because it is uh, implemented by so many different actors and in different with different techniques and in with different uh, approaches. We started by mapping the, um, uh, the main media interest initiatives in the various countries and what we are working on a lot now is to, for example, work to understand how to assess the impact of a media literacy initiative. So not only a media literacy initiative that is implemented, but trying to understand if actually it had an impact so it was, if you want, useful for, 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 for society. And then there's research, and um, uh, Stan already mentioned the importance of accessing data. Uh, for those who are less familiar, we're talking about uh, data that the online platform have on the behaviors, I mean, on, on not on the behaviors, but on the users that could actually be accessed for research purposes to understand, for example, the various behaviors or trends or uh, how basically this information uh, spreads and it is spread by whom and so on. So, um, of course, this needs to be done in full respect of GDPR. And uh, this is why uh, Edmo had a working group that actually released a uh, report that includes a code of conduct on the basis of which this access could be given. And what we are doing now, we are um, basically uh, thinking on how you could, we could uh, structure uh, an independent intermediary body that would on one side uh, vet the researchers that are asking the, the access to those data, and on the other side, of course, um, uh, ensure that, that this access is given and that everything is going as it, as it should. Uh, this whole work is um, chaired by uh, Dr. Rebecca Trumbull, and it is indeed something that when we also talk to international stakeholders, they seen with well, very much interest because it looks like something that is quite new actually in the sector and we really hope uh, that this is uh, helpful, the work that we are doing, especially considering that, it, as it was saying by Alba, um, 
this is now uh, something that is uh, in uh, Digital Services Act, the fact that this access needs to be given. And then you see here, for example, the repository that I was mentioning previously on um, that includes scientific articles on this information here. Again, it's multidisciplinary. So we have many different uh, uh, approaches to, to the topic. Uh, and then, as I was mentioning, the policy debate. So um, EDMO, of course, uh, as it is part of this whole st European strategy to tackle this information, we are also part of the task force within the code of practice, together with uh, ERGA, for example. Um, the aim of the task force is basically to make sure that the code of practice keeps being uh, aligned with the developments and also uh, to, uh, if you want, um, work on some uh, implementation uh, uh, parts of the code. Uh, and one of the main uh, tasks within the code of, uh, of practice for Edmo was or is actually to propose structural indicators. Uh, structural indicators are indicators that help us uh, understand if the code is having indeed an impact on, on, on the information ecosystem and in particular on reducing or not disinformation. And then we also produce, of course, uh, policy analysis. Uh, here I mentioned some, some example. Uh, last but not least, as it was also mentioned, our hubs. So we are lucky enough to have uh, hubs in all members, covering all member states. These are either national or multinational. And they, those are really uh, the the doers in the sense that they uh, implement media literacy initiatives in their countries, they do the local research, uh, they are in contact with the national regulatory authorities, they do local fact checking. So really, uh, we at MoEU as a platform gathers what they are doing. And uh, this is really a, a, what we think is the added value of, of such a platform, because as we know, this information has no borders, but they are clearly um, local specificities are related to this information, how it, it spreads, uh, messages that are more impactful or not, and so on. So having the possibility of having uh, uh, on the ground experts uh, in all member states is really a, a plus for a platform like, like Edmo. And I think that I will now pass it over to Giovanni because as, as it was already mentioned, um, we have established a task force in view of the uh, European Parliament elections next year. And Giovanni is the chair of this platform and we'll tell you more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paola. Giovanni. Thank you. Uh, let me start by introducing a similar effort that was conducted in the context of the war in Ukraine. And this effort was already mentioned by Paola before me. Um, I'll give a couple more details. Um, on March 3rd, 2022, the European Digital Media Observatory, EDMO, established a task force on disinformation and the war in Ukraine. Uh, it was chaired by Dr. Claire Wardle and the task force included, included 18 members representing academia, journalism, media, and civil society. The task force has met weekly for three months to discuss developments and trends in relation to disinformation in the context of the war in Ukraine and to design and steer different projects. Some of them were just mentioned before me. Uh, considering the mission of EDMO, the work of the task force did not focus primarily on the security or foreign interference aspects of disinformation related to the war, but rather on understanding the phenomenon more generally, for example, by focusing on the analysis of content that was circulating those weeks, uh, by examining the role of public interest journalism, and by researching efforts to build resilience across societies. The task force published three statements about urgent issues related to the war in Ukraine, and those were about cybersecurity, foreign propaganda disguised at fact-checking, and finally, mental well-being of investigators, as well as a final report that listed uh, 10 recommendations for policymakers, technology companies, newsrooms, and civil society, based on the observations, the research activities, and the discussions carried out in the previous three months. In addition, the task force facilitated the circulation of other content, for example, monthly briefs on detected disinformation and specific cooperative investigations that were produced by the Admo Fact Checking Network and were very much appreciated by many stakeholders, including institutional ones. Uh, with the 2024 European elections approaching, Admo, Admo has decided to replicate, in some sense, the experience 
and in January 2023, its executive board established a new task force, this time with a focus on the elections. The task force composition, and this is a partial difference from a pre previous one, reflects closely the network of national and regional admo hubs, with one representative from each, plus three members from the advisory council. The total number of components is again in 18, and it reflects ADMO's role as a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholders platform to support and coordinate activities between relevant experts communities. Among the, among the members, there are representatives from the media, fact-checkers, academics, policy and media literacy experts. <clears throat> this task force is carrying out one line of activities focused on the past, one on the present and one on the future. About the past, we have been reviewing the electoral campaigns that took place in the past year around Europe, which were about a dozen, in order to understand the most relevant disinformation narratives at the national level and the dynamics of what happened then. We hope that these insights will be useful ahead of next year's elections, since the European elections can also be interpreted and in many countries are actually perceived as the sum of 27 different national ones. Secondly, upon the present, the Edmo Hub's representatives in the task force were asked to contribute with an overview of the main risks they see stemming from their own country or region in relation to the elections. The result of this ongoing exercise will be a preliminary risk assessment report to be pub published by the end of the year that will point out the main issue we can reasonably foresee ahead of the elections. But the European parliamentary elections are still eight months ahead, after all, so a good deal of what the task force will be called to do is in the future. To better prepare, the Edmo Fact Checking Network is starting to collect information on the mis- and disinformation trends regarding Europe, and at the same time, the task force is engaging, is engaging in a challenging round of consultations with other stakeholders that are monitoring the elections in Europe, including institutions and civil society organizations. Um, in this, in, with this idea, it plans also to facilitate the dissemination of best practices and useful experiences from the media and, media and information literacy world. Um, the goal overall is to tackle the issue in a democratic and inclusive way, giving proper representation to the diversity of issues on the ground. For that, we will need the cooperation of the expert community, but also of technological platforms and civil society organizations. And this is a nice segue to who's coming after me. Thank you. So, uh we are still looking for the Minister of Truth. Apparently, we cannot find it. Uh, Eric, you represent civil society, and I see that you put some question in the chat. Um, but before to give you the floor to you, I want to read one uh, question that is in the chat from Kate Evan uh, that says, new and upcoming EU regulation focus more on preventing potential social harm when it comes to digital platform but still mostly depend on self-assessment report from big tech companies. Do you think that this approach will be effective? What could be more done in this direction? So probably this is a question that um, is near to what you want to say. Um, yes, thank you. Giacomo, uh, a word about Eurovision, Eurovision, which I'm representing. Uh, Eurovision is an association French Italian origin, the European in scope, mostly uh, interested in the idea of uh, public service in the media, uh, in media starting, starting from television, but now looking at what the meaning of public service in the era of internet and uh, social platforms. Uh, one question I have, which is regulation, because I'm listening with great interest to the presentation, is that, as I said at the beginning, the European Commission looking and the regulation is looking not at, uh, especially in, in terms of artificial intelligence, not in limiting freedom of speech for individuals, but limiting coordinated activities uh, from a foreign power or specific groups um, that try to influence 
manipulate the public opinion, but we are, we are confronted with, an with a phenomena that is, seems to be very strong among the younger generation, if you follow what the result of the Reuters Institute survey, is that younger generations don't trust the social media platforms as we knew them, the old X Twitter, for example, or Facebook, any more than the old media. They do trust more, much more the new forms like TikTok, which is based on personal experience, where it doesn't seem at the moment any actor has been able to create, strictly speaking, coordinated unauthentic activities. If this trend continues, many of the approaches there uh, could be insufficient to form, uh, how to say, waves of disinformation, waves of false narratives, if those narratives come from the direct perceptions of the users uploading those short recordings of their own life, of their own perception. So this is, this is the problem of the necessary evolution of the view of how public opinion is formed. We are no longer in the 19th century, but 20th century, the 21st century seem to change the way the public opinion is formed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, you put some of the questions on the table, but now let's go to the, the last speaker of the, the session, that is Caroline Greer. You have been put on, on the spot by many. Uh, everybody refused to take the role of Minister of Truth, so it, this means that are the platform the Minister of Truth? Absolutely not. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm not TikTok. So um, I'm not sure who to pass that one to after me. But um, no, no, of course, we're, we're not the Ministry of Truth. But um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning from Brussels. Really sorry not to be in Kyoto. Um, really interesting discussion. Um, maybe just a couple of words on the, the kind of the infrastructure and the environment that, that was described by um, institutional colleagues. Um, so TikTok is a signatory of the Code of Practice on Disinformation. Um, we're a very active signatory. Uh, we're actually co-chairing the election working group that was mentioned, and we took a leading role in the work on structural indicators. And um, we, well, all platforms published their reports, their second reports a couple of weeks ago. You will find them on the uh, Transparency Center website, disinfocode.eu. Um, TikToks alone has more than 2,000 data points, 2,600 data points, um, many, many pages. So there, there's a lot of um, meat there. And if, if anybody wants to deep delve into, you know, how we tackle disinformation and elections as part of that, uh, that report is there for the reading. But, you know, all to say, we really appreciate this ecosystem, this infrastructural model that has developed around disinformation because, as was said, I think by the first speaker, we really think that this is a, a multi-stakeholder effort. It's, it's a really dynamic, complex area to tackle. And certainly we have a big role as, as platforms, but we can't do it alone. You know, we need the support of fact checkers, of civil society, of, of um, you know, other actors within the, the ecosystem. So really important that we're coming together uh, under the auspices of the code. Um, I thought I would just say a few words about how we tackle elections as TikTok, um, since that's the, the subject of the, the panel, and just to let you know what, what sort of happens at a grand level, as it were. Um, TikTok has a global election integrity program, but we also add in a layer of local uh, flavor to that. So we work with local experts for each election um, because we really feel we, we need the expertise. While there is a, a template, if you like, of things that we do in each election, Obviously, each election comes with its own flavor, its own nuances, its political sensitivities, cultural sensitivities, et cetera. So that local approach is, is really important. Um, planning for any election begins many, many months in advance. We have an election calendar. Um, obviously, elections are happening globally. So we're just working around the clock, basically, um, and, and always moving on to, to the next election. So we have the Polish ones coming up this weekend. We've just been through the Slovakian ones. Um, so there's always an election, and obviously next year is going to be a huge year 
EU elections, 27 countries all at once, uh, UK, US elections. So it, it's going to be a very busy year. So what do we do as TikTok? We have election policies, number one. So we have our community guidelines, which set out the, the rules of TikTok, if you like, what you can post, what you can't post, what is appropriate behavior on the platform. The election policies are a subset of that. And for example, we, we don't allow political advertising as TikTok. Um, so that was a decision that we took some years ago and, and we've stuck with that. Um, we restrict the activity of political parties and politicians um, around elections. So campaign funding, for example, is, is something that we, we put the brakes on. Um, we, the external partners that I mentioned are really important. So we work with third party organizations that might give us additional intelligence around threats or trends or narratives. Um, we have our fact checkers who are really important partners for us in, in this work. So we make sure that we're fully staffed up and, and resourced with our fact checkers. We have authoritative information about the elections that we put on our platform. So for every election, we have a, an election hub, which has information about how and where to vote. And we typically link to the, the national authority um, that, uh, that, that has that authoritative information. We typically run a media literacy campaign, sometimes partnering with the, the fact checkers and our trusted flaggers are really important as well. Um, so it really is a multifaceted approach um, a local approach uh, for, for elections and a cross-functional <laughs> approach internally. Um, we have more than 40,000 staff working on trust and safety within TikTok and uh, a large part of them are also working on elections. So I'll pause there. I know we're getting close to time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to you. Um, so we are still looking for the Minister of Truth. I would ask the room to be ready to raise questions and to take eventually the microphone that is on our back. Um, I start with the question that is in the chat, that is quite direct and uh, probably is for the EU representative. What happens is one of the large platforms refuse to follow the code of practice or even to sign it. Uh, do you have remedies swift enough to prevent substantial harm to be done? Albin, I think yeah. that this is for you. And there is not is. a name, not Look, a name, but we can imagine who we are talking about. Um, but indeed, um, the, the code of practice is a voluntary instrument. I mentioned the fact that under the DSA, it may become a code of conduct, which very much links then to the enforcement regime of the DSA. But even under the DSA, the code of practice or adhering to a code of conduct for those very large online platforms will still remain a choice of theirs. Um, of course, it is one mean for trying to demonstrate uh, their compliance with their obligations under the DSA. If they choose not to sign to the code of practice slash code of conduct, they will still be able to um, demonstrate that the actions they are taking are in the range of those expected or um, able to mitigate those risks. Um, of course, then um, monitoring and transparency is key for the code and for the DSA. Um, th this is not an instant uh, tool, but uh, the reporting is regular. The assessment is being done and the kind of uh, exchanges that take place, these are on a regular basis within the code. And so bringing together under the umbrella of the code task force a number of relevant actors is precisely the objective of making um, a decisive step towards possibly addressing emerging risks or discussing it. Again, it is not about um, being a ministry of truth. We are not there to discuss what is true, what is false, but it's all about bringing this information into a context. This might be a risk. How is it addressed? And, and that's possibly the role of the fact checkers who essentially provide context and, and, and try to um, make it understood that this might be a risky um, narrative evolving. And then from there, um, indeed, if it has to be enforced under the DSA regime for some of the signatories, um, 
the way to address it would be under um, the DSA uh, enforcement tools, which again provide for additional um, the, the, the commission to ask for additional information and possibly uh, open cases of investigation in more uh, specifics about certain uh, observed um, possible failure or concerns. Um, and, and then to just mention a little bit or try to answer also a bit the second questions. Of course, this is self-reporting under the code. It's also to a certain extent, self-reporting under the DSA, which is also, a, a transparency is also very much under the DSA, uh, a, a key objective. Um, the DSA adds a layer to auditing the data and information provided by the very large platforms search engine. So there you can also expect some uh, additional tools to what is a legislation, basically. Thank you very much. So. This means that um, you have tools that could, uh, under the DSA, the code of practice is something that is a voluntary subscription, so there are the limits of the code of, the code of practice, but DSA is mandatory. So, uh, especially for the seven platforms that are under observation from the European Commission, they have to respect a certain number of rules. If they don't respect, they get a warning, and if the warning is not doesn't produce any effect, then you can enforce through what? Fines, uh, closing the platform for, to the European citizen. What are the, to the tooth that, uh, that you can use, uh, the teeth that you can use in this battle? In, in, in broad terms, indeed, that there might be um, measures proposed or um asked to be implemented by the platforms to address specific uh, identified risks or, or concerns. Um, uh, in all eventuality, this could also lead to um, potential fines, which would present, and there I would turn to Caroline maybe to <laughs> know more about exactly the, the amount of what, but it's a percentage of the global turnover of a platform, um, possibly 5%, but uh, I would leave that to uh, other informed colleagues of the panel. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question from the room, so if we can give the mic to the person there. Can they hear me? Yeah, yes. I see. I'm, okay. Uh, so we are actually talking, we are searching for Minister of the Truth here, I guess so. And my question uh, will be posed directly to TikTok because uh, I know there is a mechanism of user bubbling in some kind of information bubble. So how it works? Basically, the situation is that if you are in Ukraine, you cannot view TikToks from Russia and vice versa. If you are in Russia, you cannot view TikToks from Ukraine, even if you have direct link. Because if you follow the direct link, the basically uh, you will see some like cats and dogs video instead of the real content, which was like posted by some different country users. So somebody can call it a censorship. I'm not discussing that because there are certain pros and cons in this mechanism regarding the context of Russian-Ukraine relations. But there is still a plenty of shadow uh, in public about how this mechanism is being and this policy is being regulated by TikTok. Thank you. Can you please give us some light on that? So I, can, I guess this is a question for um, Caroline. But there is another question in the room, please. Yeah, hi, uh, Dan Arnato from the National Democratic Institute. Um, I'm curious, particularly from Edmo's perspective, but maybe others on the panel, um, how you um, are thinking about approaching uh, issues with platform uh, APIs and data access generally. Um, you're seeing um, a kind of de-emphasis of crowd tangle. You're seeing restrictions on APIs. Uh, X is becoming uh, essentially unaffordable for ordinary research organizations. Um, so I'm curious about that and also um, if uh, particularly Edmo has any engagement with um, accession uh, countries or potentially uh, future uh, partner countries because we do a lot of work with them and would be uh, interested to hear if you have any coordination or programming there. Thank you. So the first is for Caroline, the second is for Paul, I guess, unless somebody else wants to intervene. 
Please, Caroline. Yes, certainly. Um, so for TikTok, um, the Bible, as it were, are our community guidelines, um, which are applied globally. Uh, you'll find those on our website. I will say that the Ukraine-Russian situation is quite unique. There's a war going on, so we do have some measures there um, to ensure that we are, you know, protecting our, our, our users um, and making sure that the content is appropriate. But, but this is a very unique situation. So ordinarily, our community guidelines and our policies are, are what apply. You mentioned filter bubbles. We have a couple of mechanisms to um, try to push through that. Um, so you can actually refresh your feed uh, with TikTok. So you can just, if you feel you're starting to see more and more of a particular type of content, because the algorithm is seeing that you're engaging with that content and delivering more, you can hit refresh and simply reset, if you like, almost start again. We've also introduced a second recommender system, which was required under the DSA. Um, and this is a recommender system that is a non-personalized feed. So it's basically popular uh, videos in your local area. So these are mechanisms where we try to push people away or at least nudge people away from, you know, if they're, if they're falling into a bit of a rabbit hole with, with content. I hope that answers the, the question. Thank you. Um, so, Paula, what you can answer yeah. to our request about uh, research? Yeah, that was a very good question because indeed when I did my presentation, I focused on the personal data access, which is still, if you want something, it is not happening yet and should happen soon. While on public data, indeed, uh, uh, the platforms, they have different approaches. Uh, and um, indeed, as you mentioned, unfortunately, there is one elephant in the room, which is charging quite a lot of researchers. And of course, this cuts all the research projects because, I mean, the research budget cannot afford that. Uh, another issue there is the fact that uh, we learned that very, very often actually access is like even more easily to the big famous universities rather than to uh, universities in smaller countries in uh, minority languages and so on. So definitely we are aware about that. What we are doing is of course we are having regular meetings. I have to say uh, and we really appreciate the platforms as well because we are doing trainings that are actually uh, accessible online uh, with the platforms. We already started and they explain to the researchers how to access their data, uh, which are the requirements and so on, they show how it works and so on. We did it also with uh, Meta with a new uh, user, um, I think it's user interface or something, uh, a product. So uh, Edma has a good collaboration with the signatories of the code and in general with the platform. And this is something that we offer for the research community. Clearly, uh, what is often said is that it's um, it's not only about accessing the data, but also having the infrastructure to manage that. And this is also something that was an outcome of the task force that mentioned Giovanni earlier, uh, that in the EU we need to we like have the research community more equipped to be able also to uh, really technically speak speaking to, to, to work then uh, on this data and with this data. So what we, concretely and to sum up what Edmo is doing, we are organizing activities with the researchers to gather their feedback, to understand how it works. Uh, we are actually also working now on a, on a map that basically on a table that recaps uh, how you access the data of the various platforms. And then we ask our community if they had troubles or not in following that procedure. And then in parallel, of course, the, the work that I was saying on private, private data. Thank you, Paula. There is one more question in the room. Yes, I'm Chen from ISOC Taiwan chapter. Uh, as everyone see, like um, the information manipulation on um, some um, situation is getting very worse in Taiwan right now. Like um, we're facing more and more like fake news and disinformation are happening on our online discord environment. So. Uh, I think the private sector, those um, platform um, service provider is a very key player in this kind of situation right now because they are the one who's enforced this kind of um, regulation and deal with this, inf um, this information right now. I got two questions. That is, first, uh, is the way that can make the, um, the content recommendation algorithm more and more transparent so that we can know about what this kind of information or this um, short video is get on, on my own feed. And second one is, is there anything like um, the online, moderate, uh, online content moderation 
system or the team are working, is there any way that can reveal the, how this would work? What's the process you are doing the online content moderation? And if there's anything happens, like um, if my post or video got deleted, uh, is there any way to like to get through to get my um, thing or my post like got deleted? Um, like I can get it back. So that's my question. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, for mostly for Caroline, but I don't know if even the commission want to add something. Please, Caroline. Um, so, yeah, thanks for those very good questions. I will say the Digital Services Act is here to <laughs> provide all the answers that you need. So on content moderation and questions that you might have on decisions that were taken on content, um, number one, you can appeal any content decision. Uh, platforms need to provide you under the DSA with a full statement of reasons outlining what action we took, why we took it, the basis for taking it. And again, you can appeal that if you don't like the information that you see. Not only that, but we need to send that statement of reasons to a European Commission database that is publicly available. So all that information is there. There must be millions of reports in that database about every single content moderation decision that was taken by a platform. It's all open there. So information provision and the ability to appeal um, is, is in the DSA. Also at the end of October, um, we need to publish transparency reports, which will outline how we moderate content. So giving much more detail around that, including language capabilities, et cetera. So now this is for the EU region, of course, um, but you know maybe other regions are inspired by this. So more information coming on that. Recommender system, again, it was in the DSA. We were asked to provide more information uh, around the parameters of the recommender system. So really explaining in a lot of detail how the recommender system works. TikTok has a European online safety hub. Um, you can find that from our website, you'll find the link, but we post all that information there. So we want to be as transparent as possible. There's a lot of information that's being made available under the DSA. We hope folks take the time to read it because um, you know, I think the DSA has done a great job really in setting up the, the rules of transparency and um, facilitating this, these transparency efforts by, by platforms. So your suggestion to our speaker in the room is that he has to move to Europe to be more protected. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, that, that's the question for, you know, the Brussels effect, I think, you know, the, the influence that, you know, some EU regulation has on other global pieces of legislation is also an interesting topic. But, um, yeah, DSA in the first instance is, of course, EU and EEA. Okay, he's got, uh, getting to the modules for applying for European citizenship. Um, <laughs> thank you to the speakers. Uh, we are very late. We are beyond the schedule. So unless any of you has some urgent thing that need to share with the world, uh, this is the last occasion. If not, I would thank all the speakers and the people in the room, even if they were hiding far away from the camera so that you cannot see them, but you have seen at the mic. Thank you very much, and I hope that uh, you have learned uh, some interesting information through this session. Thank you. Thank you very much.